morning. It's great to be here on a wet Sunday morning, and if you're joining online, that's cool too. We're going to talk about fruit today, and I love what Miss Deborah talked about right there. For you sitting right there, don't worry, this tree is going to get smaller in a minute because we're going to actually do a little pruning this morning. And when we're talking about fruit for a minute, I want to think about the context of the scripture that Pastor Dean read. The, the one scripture he read was this, but when you produce much fruit, you are by true disciples. This brings great glory to my Father. And I, I want to look at a few verses before that because it sets the tone of what Christ is saying here for his disciples. Listen to this full passage of the scripture and then we'll start seeing what Christ meant, okay? It says, I am the true vine, and my Father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that bears fruit, he prunes, that it may bear more fruit. You're already clean because of the word which I have spoken to you. Abide in me, remain in me, grow in me. You are already clean because that word is in you. Once again, verse 4, abide in me and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it is abiding in that vine, you can neither abide and produce fruit in Christ unless you're connected to him. That first section of scripture right there has a, has a very powerful part about who we're being connected to. Let me read these next three verses. I am the vine and you are the branches. He who abides in me and I am him bears much fruit. For without me, you can do nothing. Without me, I as a Christian can do nothing. Talking about Christ. If anyone does not abide in me, he is cast out from, as a branch and is withered. And they gather them and throw them into the fire and they are burned. And finally, verse 7 says, If you abide in me and my words abide in you, you will ask what you desire and it shall be done for you. By this, my Father is glorified and you bear much fruit, so you will be my disciple. Before we pray, get an image, although I couldn't find grapevines to trim today, get an image of Christ walking through the vineyard. A, a picture of him taking the disciples, and there's the grapes, and his teaching moment, object lesson, here we go. You guys, you got to remain in me like that grapevine remind, remains in that, bran or those branches remind of that grapevine. And you know, I grew up in high school taking agricultural classes. I grew up in San Diego, very rural part, but we grew avocado trees. It was the avocado cap of the world. We grew produce trees. It was a perfect climate to grow. But as a, as a gardener, what I had to do is I had to understand when there was a dead branch to cut it off because it's not going to do anything. And then that was the easy part. But I like to see things growing. But sometimes if you want things to grow more, Jesus is describing to us the spiritual analogy, but in a, in a practical analogy, if we're gardening something and we want something to grow more, we got to sometimes prune it. I will cut this branch so it will grow more. And that probably hurts the tree. I don't know how trees think, okay? But that looks like it's a hurtful process. And so for a moment, if we are using a spiritual analogy, if we're this branch and Christ is the trunk, Christ is a vine, when we trim, get trimmed, it hurts. Maybe something went wrong at work. Maybe I had to make a decision at work that no one understands and that person's talking bad about me. Maybe I got a really bad test score. Maybe I decided to show up when, to church when everyone else is gone. I don't know what it's going to be. But if we understand that there's growth that comes when we're being pruned, sometimes those hard things become the things that will make us grow the most. And if I were to prune this shorter and shorter, I'm not actually killing the tree. When this tree gets through the winter and it comes back into the springtime and starts to grow, I've actually helped it produce more peaches. This is a peach tree, and it'll be a healthier tree. And Jesus is telling his disciples right here, as he's looking over that grapevine, sometimes as disciples and followers of Christ, we got to be pruned. And sometimes, if we're not bearing anything, it's not even like we're attached to that vine. This branch, these branches are attached to this trunk. These grapes are attached to the vine. We as Christians are attached to Christ and we abide in him. 
I love that last part of that, that quote that he said on that video. It says, as Christians and bearing fruit, we are working out what God has already worked within. I promise you this, if you're a follower of Christ, and I know I am, and I pray that each person listening is, that you are and I are supposed to be connected to the vine. And you know what the church is supposed to do? That when the church is together, we're supposed to be, when those pruning processes come up, those things we don't understand and we have to grow from, we're supposed to be encouraging each other to keep doing, keep growing, keep abiding, keep remaining in Jesus. When I was in high school, I didn't know that by cutting branches and pruning them, it was actually keeping that tree healthier. As a Christian, when those hard things come into my life, maybe it was this week, it's actually staying connected to Christ. It's making me depend on Christ more. And we love to be connection connected. I was thinking about connection this week, just humanly. Listen to these statistics about human connection here for a minute. It's good to be connected, especially in a time when there's social distancing going on, right? We want to be connected more than ever. I, I look forward to when there's no restrictions on church and worship and we can just be together again. I look forward to that day, but right now there's restrictions going on. And think about this. We want to remain connected. And I, I found this little this little survey on connectedness and how we stay, stay connected today um, through social media, Facebook, Instagram, smartphones. Who has a smartphone? All right, who's watching on a smartphone? Okay, probably most of us right now or some computer device, okay? And here's an interesting fact about connections and smartphones and things like that. 81% of Americans own a smartphone, just so you know that. The average user will tap, swipe, and click their phone 2,617 times a day. The average user. Are you clicking right now? <laughs> okay. The average time spent on smartphones is two hours and 51 minutes per day. And worldwide, more people now own a cell phone than a toothbrush. All right? Kind of weird and gross all at the same time, okay? But I tell you this, we were made for connections. We were made for connections with each other because of who we are as a church, but also we were made for connections with God. We grow, we grow in our relationship with each other and through Christ, with Christ, because of that connection. Turning back to the spiritual connection for a minute, we have to understand that when Christ is giving an example about pruning and about making more fruit grow because there will be more fruit growing now because this tree was pruned or those grape vines were pruned, we have to understand, are we connected in Christ? And the only people that are connected in Christ are Christians. There's no other way to be connected to Christ except having a relationship with him. And the Bible uses the metaphor of fruit so many times to describe uh, the produce, what our life is producing. Fruit can be either good or bad. We understand that. We see that in the scripture. Romans 7, 5 says, For when we were in the realm of the flesh, we bore the fruit of death. That's pre-conversion. That's pre-Christian, pre -Christian, okay? And then we look at um, Proverbs 11.30, and it says, A faithful Christian will produce better results. The fruit of the righteous is the tree of life. So we understand that before we're Christians, it's hard to produce the things of Christ to be a disciple because the only people that are disciples of Christ are those Christians. But some people try to fake it, and that's what Christ is saying here, I think, that don't try to fake your Christianity. Don't try to fake your relationship with me. Be really abiding in me. Fruit is a direct result of whatever is controlling our heart. The fruit of life, a fruit that's a life that's not surrendered to Christ, that will be sexual immorality. This is the fruit of the world, I guess. Sexual immorality, impurity, debauchery, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, and many more evil acts. You can go to Galatians and you can see that's not something that I'm making up. That's what the Word of God says, that those are fruit not of the Spirit. And then you go, and here's what our life is supposed to represent, and I hope this is getting more and more evident in my life. That's what I can work on is the fruit of the Spirit of God, which is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Do you see the conflict? Do you know people in the world that are producing fruit of the world? Do you know Christians that are producing the fruit of the Spirit, even when they're being pruned and hard decisions, hard, hard parts of life they're going through? 
because that's when we grow the most. God is the Father. He's the gardener in John 15, 1. And he desires us to be fruitful. Jesus said, I am the vine and you are the branches. Christ is our vine. We remain in him and we see what he's doing into our life. And, and more than ever before I see this, our world is very much a hurting world right now. There's not a lot of things really going well in it, but I think what Christ is saying that we are supposed to step into that world and be the ones who bear the fruit of him so that the world sees how much, <laughs> how much it means to have a relationship with him. And we all start somewhere with this. We've committed ourselves, if we've, when we commit ourselves to Christ, we live to please him. The natural result of this is our behavioral choices. Um, he was talking to his followers, and he said this in Matthew 7, 16 through 20. He said, do people pick grapes from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? No. <laughs> Likewise, every good tree bears good fruit, but a bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot bear bad fruit, and a bad tree cannot bear good fruit. These disciples are, are having another object lesson right here. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Thus, by their fruit, you will recognize them. And I believe this. The reason we still have life today as Christians, the reason we still have life today is because Christ wants us to bear more fruit at our schools, at our work, at our church, in our community, in our world. And how do we be fruit? Well, we look at the fruit of the Spirit. God's desire is to transform our hearts in the image of His. When you look at that person next to you, when you look at your spouse, when you look at your brother or sister, do you see Christ becoming more and more evident to them? When you look at me, hopefully you see more of Christ than more of Ken Elvin. I'm not perfect. Boy, let me tell you, Joy would agree with me, okay? I'm not perfect. But I am trying to grow in Christ. And hopefully that's where we're at. And how do we do that? Well, good works are produced. Not that they save us. Humility is produced. And forgiveness when people hurt us is produced. We begin to glorify God. So let's say, point one, we're connected to Christ. Let's say for most of us in this room and watching on TV, this is where we want to be. We want to be in that vine. So I'm assuming that all of us right now, for a moment, are connected to Christ. He is our vine, we are his branch. In his earthly ministry, he was doing a lot of things, and he said to other people, he said, I want you to glorify God the Father if you're actually a follower of me. He also made it clear that we're supposed to do the will of the Father. When God's people depend on his word in John 15, 7, we just saw that amazing scripture, and obey his will, he is glorified in it. It's also proof for ourselves that others and others that we are born again. We are his true disciples. Fifth, uh, John 15, 1 through 8, shows us that we should be producing something to be his disciples. Now, this is very important because some people get it mixed up. The, the sequence is very much an important part of this. He does not say, when you obey me, you're saved. He does not say, when you bear fruit, that earns your status of a disciple. That's not what he's saying right there. Christ specifically says that bearing fruit is happening and it's evidence of one being saved you have already been saved you bear fruit you don't work your way to heaven don't get don't get that theology that's not right theology okay we have grace we've been saved through christ through his the faith in jesus christ alone and so when that happens into our heart the minute we trust jesus christ as our savior when that happens all of a sudden we're right now able to be saved through that moment of conversion, but now God starts to produce these good works in us. You know, I have a lot of Bible talks about faith and good works going together, and I think about that. You could, you could read James 2.14, and the, the conversation that James is having is a lot what Christ said, that you can't have uh, faith separated from good works. It's kind of, I've used this before, but kind of like the blades on the shear right here, on these pruners. One blade is faith, the other is good works. That's how pruning and growth happens. But if I just had one blade, it's not going to do the job. So understand this, our faith in Christ and then good works goes hand in hand so we understand that God is growing us through all times, good and bad. Jesus points out one other thing here in this point there. 
abiding in Christ, uh, those who abide in Christ and whom his words also abide are aligned with the will of God. Um, I know sometimes as a Christian, and whether you're a pastor or a family or a, a teacher or um, just someone at your work, I don't know what you do, sometimes you have to make those tough calls, but you know it's the right call to make. It might even affect someone else's life, but you ultimately know spiritually that you have to make that call to pour into someone's life, to invest into them, and then God takes it from there. If it's a hard decision, or God has made you the recipient of a hard decision, use those times of pruning and growth so that we grow together. But do the right things. I know a lot of Christians that look the wrong way and expect someone else to deal with sin. But really, if we care so much about someone, we will look into their lives and say, I love you. Let's get through this together because we're connected through Christ. Merely pretending to have eternal life isn't going to get us into heaven and it's not going to be real growth into our life. Are we connected to the world or to the word of Jesus Christ? Remember, sometimes God will prune us to make us bear more fruit. Are we connected to Christ? Let's say we are connected to him. What is some evidence of the fruit in my life? And I, when I was in college and seminary, um, I studied and met personally a man named Charles Ryrie, a great theologian. And I love studying his word and he had his words, and he has a study Bible that's just so powerful. But he had this part in here, and this is my last point about the fruit that we bear that really challenged me um, about what are some practical examples of fruit or fruits, okay? I don't know if it's fruit or fruits, plural, okay? But what are some examples of the fruit in our life? Fruit number one, developing Christian character is fruit. The goal of the Christian life may be stated as Christ-likeness. Then surely every trait developed in us that reflects his character must be fruit that is pleasing to him. Many parts of the Bible talk about the fruit of the Spirit, but I found one passage in, in Peter and in Galatians that have two of the same words fruit in it and in peter uh, and in galatians it says um, have love and have self-control so i see god kind of saying those are important things demonstrate love even to those who hurt me and then have self-control when dealing with others and growing so developing a christian character is fruit fruit number two the right character will result in the right conduct and we live a life of good works because we're producing fruit. In Colossians 1.10, we are producing our life of good contact. This goes hand in hand with as we grow in our relationship with Christ. For we, as we learn what pleases him, God says, simple example, don't murder. We know not to murder. God says to run to someone who's hurt you. You run and you forgive them as he's forgiven us. But as we grow in our conduct, or we grow in our abiding in his word, our conduct closes him in him. Fruit number three, those who come to Christ through our witness are fruit. This is why from the youngest elementary kids to the oldest person I know, I will call people up usually when I'm talking and say, share with me your faith story. Because if we're not saying our faith story with our words of our lips, no one's going to really hear how God has gotten a hold of our heart. So when we share our faith story, if I called Pastor Dean up here right now, he could tell me when he became a Christian, someone else might hear that, and then they say, I want what Dean has. I want what you have. Because they see God not, uh, they, they see God working our life, not that we're perfect, but we see God's fruit in our life. Fourth fruit, we give bare fruit by our lips. Giving God the glory and thankfully confessing to his name, his name to everyone. In other words, our lips bear fruit. You have lip bearer. You are lip bearers, okay? Fruit bearers with your lips, okay? This is amazing because when we sing these worship songs, we are giving glory to God. When you mean it in your heart, sorry, we are meaning it to God and we are giving praise and bearing fruit to him. Are we thanking God today? We're going into a season of thanksgiving. I can probably say a lot of people this year had a hard time thanking God. 
but then I could look around and say, praise the Lord that we can thank him through. We're healthy right now. We have a church home. We have a family. And even if that hard time came in, we could thank God and say, you know what? Thank you, God, for being there and strengthening me to get through it. I know it's been a hard year for a lot of us. But guess what? I could still give God thanks. And then as we're in stewardship month right now, this is kind of cool. Charles Ryrie writes, fruit number five, we bear fruit when we give money. Paul designated the collection of money for the poor saints in Jerusalem as fruit. You can read about it in Romans 15, 28. So when we give to the church, we're giving so fruit can be produced. When he thanked the Philippians for their financial support in his ministry, he said that their act of giving brought fruit into their account in Philippians. So whatever God is giving us to steward, we get to be stewards producing fruit, the fruit of Christ. And you can tell what's important to someone. You look at their calendar and their checkbook, and those are usually signs of what the most important things are in their life, their time and their resources. So are we re being stewards of what God gives us to produce that fruit? Once again, the five fruits. Fruit number one, a Christ-like character. Number two, a life characterized by good works. Good works doesn't save you. Good works is produced because of your faith in Christ. Number three, a faithful witness. Are we the same in front of people as we are by ourselves? A pair, number four, a pair of lips that praise God. And number five, a generous giving of one's money. I love that Charles Ryrie put these little practical applications down because when I hear an illustration about bearing fruit and about pruning and about all this stuff, it goes way beyond just a, a bushel of grapes. The spiritual stuff comes into my life with practical application. And that's what Charles Ryrie said here, but that's also what the Word of God, practical application is all through it. And I know this, we've been talking a lot about discipleship. If I am a follower of Christ, but I've not read this, I will not know what he wants me to do. And so a disciple of Christ, as he bears fruit, he understands God's Word. I've had a practical uh, thought this whole fall so far and into the summer. And on your seat as we wrap up, I put a little sticker on here. And a sticker helps me to write, it says, Be Salt and Light, Dalton First United Methodist Church. And why would I make a sticker that says this? And my goal is to get it to every church family. Because when I go out to my car or my bike or whatever I have as a mode of transportation or I put it on my guitar case or whatever it is, it's a reminder for me what the Word of God says to be salt and light. And why would we need to be salt and light today? Because we have a very dark and unflavorful world. And it comes from the Scripture in Matthew 5, 13 through 16. And it says this, Disciples, fruit bearers, it says this, you are the salt of the earth, but what good is it if the salt has lost its flavor? Can you make it salty again? It'll be thrown out and trampled underfoot as worthless. The next part of scripture says, you are the light of the world, like a city on a hilltop that cannot be hidden. No one lights a lamp and then puts it under its, a basket. Instead, a lamp is placed on its stand where it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your good deeds shine out for all to see so that everyone will praise your heavenly Father. And I think this is so important to us today because the more fruit we bear, the stronger our testimony becomes. But if we're not bearing any fruit, it's hard to even be noticed in our community with flavor and with light. I really don't know what you're going to face this week. Last week, I had to face things that I had no idea were coming for me. And I had to make right decisions. Decisions that sometimes people say that was the wrong decision, but I knew as a Christian that was the right decision. Have you ever been there? And so when you make those decisions, you stand on the word of God that you're connected to that vine as the branch. And sometimes when you do that, you will be pruned, and it might sting and ouch you a little bit along the way, okay? But he promises you will grow through that. Connected to the vine of Christ.
producing the fruit of Christ as his disciples. And as you go through this week, whatever that challenge is, whatever that blessing is, look for the ways that God is growing you, and I will look for the ways God is growing us. I know this more than anything else, that the words of God don't go out void, they don't go out null. The word of God says, as we abide in him, he will never leave us. Let's pray together. Lord, I love you. I'm so thankful to share with friends, and I'm very humble to do that this morning. Because I'm growing just as much as they are. I feel like this week you've pruned me, God, and I don't like it. It stings. But I know it's worth it. And I'll hold on to that truth that you are in control and you haven't left me. You're still remaining in me and I'm remaining in you. And Lord, for friends in this room and on on the internet right now, Lord, whatever we're going to come up against this week, may we remember the illustration of you pruning us and may we understand a disciple bears much fruit. And so into these situations, good or bad this week, may we, oh Lord, may we see how you grow us and those who have contact with us. We love you, Jesus. Thank you for real fruit and that we get to abide in you. In your name, Jesus, amen. All right, let's stand and worship together as we respond.